Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. I know that's true, and I hope that you feel that as well. But as we go through the service this morning, I hope we can also see that while God's spirit is in this place, there are many people in that place, in many places out there, who don't feel the presence of the Lord, who don't know the freedom that God's spirit brings because, well, we haven't shared the message with them. My prayer is that each one of us may start to discover where that place, where God is calling us to reach out to others, might be. But we begin this morning in this place. And let's stand as Abby leads us in the liturgy for Father's Day. Happy Father's Day indeed, church. Fathers, we are so grateful for you. Please know that and hear us as we say that. You're all such gifts. Won't you follow along with me as I give this liturgy for this great Father's Day? Lord, on this day, set aside to honor and remember fathers, we give you thanks for our fathers. We are grateful that you chose to give us life through them and that they received the gift of life from your hands and shared it with us. Thank you, what serve presence. We thank you for the men who raised us, who were our fathers in childhood, whether biological fathers, adopted dad, older brother, uncle, grandfather, stepfather, or someone else. We pray for older dads whose children are grown. Give, Give them joy and satisfaction for a job well done. We pray for new dads experiencing changes they could not predict. Give, Give them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for expectant men who will soon be dads. Give them patience and good counsel. We pray for dads who face the demands of single parenthood. Give them wisdom and strength. We pray for dads who enjoy financial abundance. Give them time to share with their families. We pray for dads who are raising their children in poverty. Give them relief and justice. We pray for dads trying to balance vocation and family. We pray for stepdads. We pray for dads who are separated from their children. We pray for dads who have lost children. We pray for dads who gave up their children for adoption. We pray for adoptive fathers. We pray for boys and men who think about being dads. Give them wisdom and discernment. 
We pray for all men who have assumed their father's role in a child's life. Give them joy and the appreciation of others. We pray for church dads who show us the ways of faith. Give them the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of their fathers. Lord, we thank you for the gift of fatherhood. We thank you for the many examples of faithful fathers in scripture. Now hear the names of other men who have inspired us by their fatherly examples. Don. We are mindful this Father's Day of all these men, and especially Joseph, the earthly father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had the courage and faith to say yes to your calling. May these men we honor today emulate these examples of faith, and may they model for the rest of us what it means to be your loving disciples. Bless them on this special day. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Philadelphia Moravian Church on Father's Day, June 19th. Um, we begin by asking you, if you haven't done so already, to reach for a friendship pad. This is really helpful in documenting your attendance today, and so please reach for that and let us know that you are here. Also, remember that it's summertime and you are welcome to dress more casually if you like. Pastor Sam is an excellent example of someone who finally got the memo. <laughs> Starting next Sunday, there will be an additional worship opportunity at 1130 right here in the sanctuary. Refer to your bulletin for more information or if you're watching from home, just go to our website and you'll get a special announcement there from Pastor Sam. Boxes in the library are for collecting lunch items for the Sunnyside Freedom School. If you haven't heard of the Freedom School, it's a summer program that builds strong, literate, empowered children prepared to make a difference today. Anthony's Plot Community has hosted the program since 2017, and if you'd like to contribute items, you may do that, and you may also help us pack 65 lunches on June 29th. For more information or to sign up for that, um, you can speak to Valerie Crane, Tina Spock, or Kay Windsor. Um, I'd like to thank Valerie and Michael Crane, Sandy Jones, and Kay Windsor for helping to proof our anniversary project on Friday. It's almost ready to go to print, folks, so that's pretty exciting. And now for a special announcement about this project, I'd like to ask David Stanfield as head of trustees to come forward and give you a little more information. Good morning. I know we've uh, wished the fathers a happy Father's Day already, but I also want to thank the ladies of the uh, congregation that make us make better fathers. Um, Friday, I came down to the church uh, to take care of a little business, and I, I wandered in there where uh, Kay and Clyde and Teddy were doing editing on the book. And, you know, after a lot of friendly banter, I said, 
Clyde, if this book is so wonderful, when are we going to make an announcement about getting it distributed? And she said, you are. So it ought to be a lesson in that. Um, well, basically three things I want to talk about. Uh, one is that uh, through some uh, generous funding, uh, uh, a copy will be provided for each member family. Uh, for those people that would like to have another copy for a, a child, a relative out of town or something, we, we will have to limit our run because these things are fairly expensive, uh, but we will have a certain amount of overrun that we will sell for $35 a book. It's important if you would like to get an extra book to see, uh, let Clyde know by the end of next week, or you can let me know and I'll get the word to her. And thirdly, not to mention an opportunity, I understand there's been a couple of people that would like to contribute to the project as a second mile gift. Uh, be happy to uh, take that as well. So thank you very much, and I understand the uh, book will be uh, distributed somewhere around our anniversary uh, uh, week. And uh, certainly I want to add my thanks to Clyde and her team to put out a very nice product that will help us better connect as a congregation. Thank you. And thank you to the trustees for finding funding for it. It always makes it more fun to work on something when you know that you can actually pay the invoice when it arrives. So thank you very much. Um, one last announcement. Um, there will be photos again taken in the Friendship Room following this service. And you may come by to do that or to ask more questions about the instant directory or other online ways of communicating with the church. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. And David, you ought to know that if you go up to Clyde and say, someone ought to, you are the someone. So that, that's always the case. We continue to remember in our prayers Dermont Morris and Iona Lewis and others for whom we have um, been praying and lifting up in prayer. I would add to our prayers today Molly Donnell. She is the daughter-in-law of Bill and Elaine Donnell, and she is in intensive care in Switzerland. And so not only the, the seriousness, but also the distance. Um, so we lift up um, the entire Donald family, and especially Molly, in our, in our prayers today. We pray for others who need God's healing and loving presence in a, in a special way today. And for our time of prayer, we will focus on the unconditional love of our Heavenly Father. And we make it our mission and our goal to reflect that greatest kind of love in all of our relationships, in our families, in our congregation, in the community, and in our world. Let us pray.
There are many ways to support the ministries of this church, and we appreciate your tithes and offering. If you are watching from home, there are secure portals through which you may give, and so we ask that you now consider to give and give generously.
Join me in praying today's prayer from the daily text. Lord, you gave your all for humanity. Teach us to give sacrificially so that the message of hope and reconciliation can reach all peoples. Amen. If you would like to reach for a pew Bible and turn to page 947, 947, you'll find yourself in Galatians, and that's where our epistle reading comes from this morning, third chapter beginning with verse 23. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Sam will read the uh, the gospel lesson right after, right before the sermon. So now we're going to have the children's message. So before Jesus, when Sam 
or any of us, messed up. We were stained with the stains that just stayed on us. So, if Sam lied, or he cheated in a game, or he said something unkind to one of his sisters, or if he was jealous of a gift that a game that a friend had gotten. Whenever he did any of those things, those stains stayed on him. The stain wouldn't come out. But then, Jesus came. Our scripture this morning tells us that if we believe in Jesus and we are baptized into Christ, now those stains are covered. They are covered by Jesus. So when God looks at Sam, he doesn't see the stains anymore. He doesn't see the mistakes he's made. He sees the pure white robe of Jesus instead of the stains. But that's not the end of the story. You know what else? That clean white robe is available to each of us. If you believe in Jesus and are baptized into his name, and if I believe in Jesus and I'm baptized into, my na into his name, we each get a clean white robe. This morning's scripture, you were all baptized into Christ, so you were all clothed with Christ. This shows that you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now in Christ, there is no difference in Jew or Greek, no difference between slaves and free men. There is no difference between male and female. You are all the same in Christ Jesus, you belong to Christ. How cool is that? To think that even when I mess up, even when Sam messes up, we are all going to mess up. We're human. Even if we're trying our very best to be good. And we're trying to love everybody all the time, we're still all going to mess up. But if we love Jesus and we trust in him, we get wrapped in Jesus so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see the mess. He doesn't see the sins. He sees the clean white robe of Jesus washed in his blood. That frees us to live and love and serve like Jesus, not carelessly, but full of grace and thankfulness and bravery, like we'll talk about in Sunday school this morning. Now that is pretty cool and pretty amazing and something to celebrate. So we're going to celebrate today with a fun song, I've Been Redeemed.
Please be seated. We have a story in Luke's gospel about someone else who was redeemed, set free, someone who didn't think that would ever be possible and no one had ever told them. But listen, this story is in Luke chapter 8, and if you want to follow along, it's on page 841 in your pew Bibles. Now when I say they, that refers to Jesus and the disciples. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. I received an early Father's Day gift from our son, Tim. And it's a book, but Tim must have been talking with Clyde or maybe colluding because the title of the book is, Dad, I Want to Hear Your Story. And the book hasn't been written yet because Dad has to write it. But as I skimmed through the pages, I realize that I really will enjoy thinking back to some of the memories that are requested in the book. I started thinking about our dad and our mom, and I remembered a word, and Sandra and Carol and Steve will remember this as well, a word that our mom liked to use a lot. Now actually, I guess technically it's not really a word, it's just a syllable, only three letters, H-U-H, huh. But for my mom, our mom, that syllable could be used in many different ways and with lots of different meanings. There was the huh with a period after it. That meant, well, I'm not really interested in what you're saying, but I need to appear to be interested since I'm your mom and I love you. So for example, mom, Ben Bagnell can put 17 jelly beans in his mouth all at once and then chew them up and swallow them. Huh, period. Or, Mom, I'm going to try to beat Ben's record and put 18 jelly beans in my mouth. Huh, comma, do you remember that you have a dentist appointment on Tuesday? But then there was the huh with an exclamation point that really genuinely meant wow. And sometimes it also meant I'm really pleased with you and proud of you, son. Mom, 
I've decided to follow in yours and dad's footsteps and serve as a missionary in Central America. Huh. And finally, there was the huh that meant, wait, what? Huh? With a question mark. Sometimes that meant, I never thought of that. But it could also mean, you can't be serious. It's amazing, I think, how mom could say so much with those three little letters, huh? Well, as I read through our assigned gospel reading for today in Luke chapter 8, I saw lots of different huh moments. But the question that kept coming in my mind was, which kind of huh are we talking about? The story begins in verse 26 with, with these words. Now, then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. That sounds like a type one, huh? They, the disciples of Jesus, sailed across the lake to the country of the Gerasenes, huh, period. But if we go back a ways, we may see that this is really more of a huh, or even a huh? Let me explain. We're in chapter 8 in Luke. That means there were seven chapters before this part, and there are some really important things in that part. So if we want to understand this part, then we need to go back and take a look at that part. Now, Bruce and Sandra, don't get nervous. It will just take a minute, and they know why I'm telling them that. When, when Jesus begins his ministry, back in chapter 4, in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, he declares the purpose of his earthly ministry to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Already, people were starting to get a little nervous. They weren't sure whether to respond with, huh, or whether to respond with, huh, comma, but what does this have to do with us? You're talking about the poor and the prisoners and the blind and the oppressed. What about us good old folks here in your hometown in this place? And Jesus reminded them that two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, instead of ministering to widows and lepers in their own hometowns in this place, no, they had gone and ministered to people in that place, in places like Sidon and, and Syria of all places. Now you may remember, we had this story a, a year or so ago, that the hometown folks didn't really like what they were hearing. They thought that Jesus was supposed to be for us, for us, not for them, for them. And so they drove him out of town. But that's okay, because that's where his ministry was going to take place, out of town, in that place, in Galilee, out in the marginalized areas with those people. He called 12 disciples to join him in this mission. And in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we see ministry and mission happening, healings, teachings, raising a widow's son from the dead. But the disciples start to see a pattern. Jesus is healing lepers and they're really not supposed to have anything to do with them. He's ministering to widows who are often neglected. He healed a paralytic, and most people saw those conditions as, as a result of sin. So, so why is Jesus doing this? And then he heals a Roman centurion's servant, part of the oppressive government, not one of us. So as Jesus' ministry unfolds, he doesn't seem to be focusing on the right people. And he even starts talking about loving our enemies. And then we get to chapter 8. And we see in the beginning of the chapter that besides the 12 men disciples, there are some women with Jesus. These are women who have been cured by him or had evil spirits cast out. Women like Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna and many others, it says, women. Jesus just doesn't seem to be doing this the right way in their eyes. And then one day, according to verse 22 that comes right before the story that we had today, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. Now again, we might hear that and say, huh, they're going to the other side of the lake. But for the disciples, that would have definitely been, huh? 
You want us to go to the other side of the lake, to that place? What was the problem with that? Well, you may remember that, for one thing, because of the geography and topography where the Sea of Galilee is located, we looked at this story before, that sea is known not only for the intensity of its storms, but also for their suddenness. And last year, we looked at that story where that did happen. There was a sudden storm, but we also saw that Jesus calmed the storm. There was another reason that going to the other side, to, to that place, would have been a huh moment. Did you notice in that first verse of our reading today that it says, then they arrived in the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. I don't think the word opposite is only referring to physical location on the opposite side of the lake. No, that place was opposite Galilee in almost every way. This was a Gentile area where no self-respecting Jewish rabbi would ever go. So crossing the lake meant crossing social and spiritual boundaries, eating with unsuitable people, associating with the unclean, healing people at the wrong time and in the wrong way. The disciples must have been thinking, he's taking this too far. He's already got us out here on the edge in Galilee, out of our comfort zones, and now this. The next thing you know, he'll be wanting us to go to Samaria with those people in, in that place. But they went. The disciples trusted Jesus enough to go where he wanted to take them. And... How were they greeted? Well, when Jesus stepped ashore, it says he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. Now, we might respond to that with, huh? It sounds pretty strange to us, a demon-possessed man. But maybe we need to think about that word possessed. The word probably makes us think of horror movies like, like The Exorcist. But if we possess something, that means we own it. It belongs to us. So if someone is possessed, that means they are owned by someone or something else. They belong to someone or something else. It might be a demon, but sometimes we call those demons by other names. Addictions, hatred, prejudice, misguided goals and priorities, things that take over our lives and won't let us be free. We can be bound by all kinds of things. Some are bound by fear. Fear of dying. Fear of illness. Fear of becoming financially destitute. Fear of being alone. Some are bound by pain. The pain of some disease. Or, or the pain of some trauma that was inflicted on them. Some are bound by economic issues. Maybe they simply just can't make enough money to support their family. Or maybe they've made some bad choices and have gotten themselves into more debt than they can handle. Or maybe they simply live in a place where a decent house costs more than a family can afford and are strapped with a huge mortgage that they can barely afford to pay. But no matter what it is that has us bound, no matter what it is that possesses us, the bigger problem is that those things can become our identity. We are defined and shaped by the things that possess us. Did you notice in our story that Jesus asked the man his name? And it says that he answered and said, Legion. His name, he said, was Legion, for many demons had entered him. That wasn't his name. Legion was not his name, but his identity had been taken over by this legion, this multitude of demons that possessed him and wouldn't let him be free. Now, other people had recognized his problem, but they didn't have the power to set him free. In fact, verse 29 says that they tried to deal with the situation by putting his hands and his feet in chains and keeping him under guard. He was already bound by demons, and they tried to fix that problem by binding him with chains and shackles. Sometimes our human solutions just make the problem worse. 
but Jesus had already announced that the purpose of his ministry was to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to set the oppressed and the possessed free. This man just hadn't heard that good news yet. So he was still bound, possessed by other forces. Kind of like more than 250,000 enslaved people in Texas who had been possessed by other human beings and had already been declared free, but they hadn't gotten that good news until 157 years ago today in Galveston, about two and a half years after their freedom, their emancipation was proclaimed. Why hadn't they heard? Because no one had told them. There are many who are bound in many ways and possessed by many things, just waiting for the good news of their deliverance, waiting for someone to tell them. Imagine the feeling when we find out that we are free. Well, the man in our story was so overcome with emotion that he begged Jesus to, to let him stay, to stay with him in, in this place, this place of liberating healing and redemption. But Jesus said, no, you need to go to that place, to the places where others need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and share the good news with them. Well, Clyde and my son Tim have been reminding us that we all have a story to share. We've all witnessed God's transforming, life-giving, chain-breaking power in our lives in some way. And it's great to, to gather here in this place and talk about that and, and sing about it and celebrate it. But we need to go to that place and tell others. Let them know that they have been set free. Their emancipation has been proclaimed because there are many who need to hear that. That God's liberating spirit is in that place as well as in this place. Someone has to tell them. Well, about five years ago, there was a young woman who seemed to be doing well. She had overcome a, a serious disease after a two-year battle and was making a name for herself. But she was bound by lots of things, things like fear and insecurity. And those things were becoming her identity. Someone needed to remind her of the liberating good news of Jesus so that she could find her identity in him. Well, thankfully, someone did, and she did. She found her identity in Jesus, and she proclaimed that good news in a song. Listen.
Let's pray. God, we do believe. We believe that you are here in this place, and we thank you that we do feel your sweet, sweet, liberating spirit here in this place. We're thankful that you are in that place because we know that wherever we are and wherever they are, you are there. You meet us wherever we are. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's stand and sing. As I raise one hand asking God's blessing on those of us who are here in, in this place, and I will say it, it is wonderful to be able to be in this place and to, to feel God's spirit among us, but I also raise another hand asking God's blessing on people who find themselves in that place, whatever that place may be, physically, spiritually, um, in terms of, of illness or in challenges and storms that they are facing. And I ask God to help us be the ones who will share the news of that liberation with them so that they won't go on for a century not knowing that they have been set free by, by the blood of the Lamb. It's up to us to share that message with those who need to hear it. So receive the blessing of the Lord. The amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unending and unconditional love of God the Father, and the powerful and sweet presence of the Holy Spirit be with us in this place and with them in that place, in Jesus' name.